Previously on Dragon Ball DC. The Mighty Saiyan race was feared throughout the universe, but eventually met their end at the hands of a vicious tuffle of Daxmite creation. But some Saiyans survived, including one lone child sent to the planet Earth and found by a kindly couple. His Saiyan powers manifested under a full moon and took the life of Jonathan Kent. But the kindly Martha took in the injured baby and decided to raise him as her own. This is how the story of Kakarot Kent began. The years passed and the baby Kakarot grew into a strong and healthy boy, but his life would be forever changed when he left his home and traveled the world seeking to fight strong foes. He went on a quest and met many masters in his travels, and honed his skills most notably under the great martial artist Yi Ching, skills that he put to the test against threats along his path. Kakarot would travel to Metropolis to face the most powerful man on Earth, punching Lex Luthor and making his debut to the world. Becoming an oblivious hero, Kakarot spent years defending the planet and his friends alongside the Justice League, now joined by a reformed Luthor going by the name Superman. But his toughest test came when other Saiyan survivors arrived on the planet. The battle was hard fought, but Kakarot and the League were able to stop them and imprison the Prince Vegeta. Their next adventure took them across the universe as they traveled to find the emotional entities and revive their fallen friends, meeting friends such as the warrior Broly and encountering the killer of the Saiyan race himself, Robo Zar. Zar brought Kakarot to the brink of defeat, but thanks to the sacrifice of Batman, the legendary Super Saiyan was brought forth. The battle ended with the planet exploding and the League returned to Earth, believing Kakarot to have died alongside Batman in order to gather the entities and revive their friends. But Kakarot was not the only Super Saiyan. Soon the Prince Vegeta tapped into the magnificent power in his island prison, as well as the mysterious Superboy, who seems poised to become a hero following in his father's footsteps. With Lex Luthor becoming president, and Kakarot now returned to Earth after many adventures out in the universe, such as his learning from the planet Mogo, and his liberation of the Saiyan Broly. What awaits our heroes now? Doom looms in the night sky. Doom. Warrior race. Failed invader. Martial artist. Adventurer. The story of Kakarot Kent and the alien species known as the Saiyans within our universe is a complex one, but while their deeds throughout space were heinous, I believe that we can learn from the best of their ilk. And their last son, Kakarot Kent, who died to save everyone. We can redeem their legacy. Dr. Quentin, I am an engineer. I helped you set up an atmosphere here on the moon to do work, not talk about fallen heroes. What could we possibly learn from a bunch of space Spartans with laser hands? <laughs> well, they're also giant monkey werewolves, and that's why we're here. The energy they use to transform could have massive benefits for the human heart. The sheer volume of energy required to change a humanoid form into a creature of that size? The possibilities are never-ending. Unfortunately, Doctor, your possibilities will be coming to an end quite shortly. Meanwhile, at LexCorp headquarters, on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, D.C., an alert sounded, and President Lex Luthor summoned his Superboy into the Oval Office. Before that though, make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet, so you never miss out on an episode of Dragon Ball DC. Your report on today's patrol will have to wait. This is a situation on the moon. Three terrorists have taken hostages at Quintum's cute little moon base. Are you fatigued from the patrol? I can replenish your reserves while we wait for the teleporter to come online. That will be necessary. Excellent. Then the teleporter will be ready in a matter of minutes. Sorry, Father. What I mean is, neither will be necessary. I've never had to exert myself in a fight. 
this will be no different. And I don't need to wait on the teleporter. The distance is like... 238,900 miles? I can make that in a jump. With a burst of inhuman speed, Subject G0011522134789 exited his father's oval office, leaped off the rose garden lawn, and soared into the upper atmosphere. As he began to leave the stratosphere, he held his nose and closed his mouth, just as a precaution. Leo Quintum had designed and helped grow a family of superpowered beings that acted as scientists, explorers, and philosophers in realms of the superhuman. From exploring the Earth's core to mining the vacuum of space, these beings were our future. However, they were just appetizers to parasites. Artificial meat isn't as good, but I'll deal. I thought he just drained him. This is too much even for me. Are we almost done yet? Not until the doctor gives us the designs to the teleporter. Unless he wants to watch Parasite devour more of his children. They were born to explore the depths of creation. Brute force intimidation tactics became obsolete a century ago. Maybe we'll have better luck with Dr. Iron. Hope, villains! I am the unmitigated champion of justice, the vanquisher of evil, the Super Saiyan superhero, Superboy! What are you doing? You're making a fool of yourself. This isn't a joke. Follow protocol. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, father. This conversation was allowed to happen as the sheer shock of Superboy's entrance and ensuing antics left the villains in complete disbelief. Leo took this chance and made a dash away from the distracted Deathstroke, leading Major Force to snap out of his shock and chase the scientist. Where do you think you're going? I'm faster than the speed of sound, you can't escape me! The speed of sound is 767.269 miles per hour. That's nothing. Superboy's fist emerged out of the back of Major Force's torso before anyone else in the room even registered what had happened. With an absent look, the young Saiyan tossed the villain to the side, leaving Major Force to focus all of his energy on holding in and healing the gaping wound in his gut. Okay, now the one in charge. You. Deathstroke narrowed his gaze, the decades of battle and death pouring over his soul. He had been in hopeless situations before. He had faced Kakarot Kent in battle. And he knew the only response he could give. Oh god, oh god, please, no, not another one, not again, not again! The assassin dropped his weapons and began to beg on the floor in front of the quite confused Saiyan. Superboy poked the Terminator in the head and knocked him out. This all seemed to have wrapped itself up rather nicely, just like all of Superboy's missions. That is, it would have, if not for the fact that whoever had recruited this team clearly didn't count on Parasite's unquenchable appetite, and Major Force being turned into an overflowing buffet of power. What are you doing? No! No! If you didn't want to feed me, you should have kept your suit on. The atomic power he's consuming is too much. Superboy, you have to prevent him from eating any more. He'll become unstoppable. He can eat all he wants. It's not gonna help against me. Meanwhile, at the Daily Planet, Lois Lane was moving the mountains of Pokemon cards collected by Laughly's off her keyboard. She needed to get her screen up to start writing the evening edition. Her interview with Wonder Woman about the same Prince Vegeta's burgeoning attempt at reform was sure to grip the nation. Diana had asked Lois to cover the story as an exclusive. She knew Lois Lane was the only reporter she could trust to bring the news to the world. Lois was cynical, but she always told the truth. 
The public would discover Vegeta's new method of community service through the pen of the best reporter in the world. So, while I punch this out, how are you holding up? Marvelously. While the rise in misguided foes has been difficult to cope with, it's not nearly as bad with the rest of the Justice League around again. Handling all of that on my own was challenging, but I've come out the other side stronger than ever. Well, that's a relief. I'm not sure the world would keep spinning without you to look after things. I know you can handle it, but don't burn yourself out. I can take a couple of your shifts when you need. I fear you'd be too harsh on the regular threats the Justice League handles. <laughs> That's your problem. You're too soft on them. Couple interviews with me and I'd have them begging for the slab. Hey Lo, you might want to spell check. The I in Saiyan comes before the Y. Jenny, no one cares how it's spelled. Well, I think to show respect to a fallen people, it's quite important. See? Wonder Woman agrees with me. What tenacious thief is trying to steal the moon from me? Jenny, it's your turn to watch him. Nuh-uh, that's why I came over. Your shift started two minutes ago. So you just left him in front of the TV? It'll rot his brain. And he doesn't have much of one to start. It's informative. I left it on the news. What channel? Crocs. <laughs> oh, that isn't news. I know, but it just gives us so much material for the podcast. During this exchange, Wonder Woman had walked over to observe what was happening on the television. Apparently, John Henry Irons had sent a distress call that some kind of attack on Quintum's lunar lab was underway. The new hero, Superboy, was evidently on the scene, but she thought she should go check it out, just in case. Diana walked over to say goodbye to Lois and Jenny. War's never over, huh? The God of War always said that there must be another, but that is the poison of war, the thought that there has to be one. With a gracious smile, the Amazon flew out of an open window in Perry White's office, making her way to the Hall of Justice in order to access a teleporter to the moon. She is so cool. I thought I was so cool. I demand to be cool too! Superboy's fist rocketed into what could be called Parasite's jaw, smacking his gigantic mass through the base wall and out onto the surface of the moon. The young Saiyan then unleashed a flurry of key blasts, each aimed at a different part of the monstrous blob. With his foe on the back foot, Superboy increased the ferocity of attacks, hundreds of blows, turned to thousands as he laid into the purple leech. Had enough? Parasite's body was mush. No remnants of a human form remained. Only a purple blob of writhing flesh and teeth. The mass was pulsing, and the confident Superboy charged forward, ready to end this battle with a dive kick. But to his horror, he was engulfed by the wave of meat. The creature's malleable body absorbing all of the attacks Superboy had been so confident in, and reforming toward more humanoid features, but in titanic proportions. This... this is... Man, I've never had stuff this good. Keep it going, boy. Don't get scared on me yet. Superboy struggled to free himself from Parasite's grasp, the purple flash forming over his small body, all of his attempts to escape with key blasts only increasing the being's strength. He had miscalculated, assuming that Parasite would only be able to absorb so much before being unable to retain his senses. But Parasite didn't need his senses. He didn't need to think. He just felt the hunger. And that was enough to keep his monstrous power active. Sir, I need assistance. I don't know how to handle the situation. Please! <sighs> Disappointing. You should be able to locate the central point of his energy. That's where his body is weakest. By firing a blast at that exact location, you can overwhelm his system temporarily and escape. Superboy closed his eyes. His vision was almost entirely covered by now. He tried to sense Parasite's energy, 
to hone in on the weakest point. But he couldn't. He was overwhelmed. I, I can't. There's just too much. So many different energies all screaming out. All that power. I... I can't do it. Then you're no son of mine. Tears fell down the boy's cheek as Lex had given up on him. Because he wasn't good enough. Lex was right. He had messed up. And now he was going to die. Drained to a husk in the belly of this disgusting creature. My calculations led me to think you'd be better than this. Stop wasting my time. Either fight it, or die. Parasite felt the last of the Super Saiyan's energy feed into him. It was a pure source of power, the likes he had never tasted before, and he was satisfied for the first time in years. Never gonna eat that well again. Suddenly, beams of golden light emerged from the creature's stomach, as Superboy blew apart the purple monster in a gigantic wave of energy. See, my math is never wrong. The young Saiyan collapsed to his knees after his dramatic surge of power, now completely spent. His Super Saiyan form meant his stamina was always a concern, but he had never felt as drained as he did right now. That surge of anger brought out a reserve he didn't know he had, but it vanished as quickly as it came, and Parasite was reforming now dwarfing the moon base itself, eclipsing the Earth. I thought you were all tapped out, but you... You've still got more in the tank, boy. Give it to me. Feed me. The Lavender Leviathan slivered his way toward the Saiyan. The boy, who was now so much less than Super, Try to move away, to stand, to run, but he lacked the strength to even crawl. All his power that he'd been so confident in had been sacrificed to this monster, making its way to finish him off. In that moment, the boy did the only thing he could think of. He begged for help. Please, father, help! As Parasite's humongous hand charged towards the helpless boy, it was suddenly chopped to pieces by the rotation of a staff, sending the attack flying harmlessly away. Superboy looked up to see a man dressed in an orange gi, standing between him and certain doom. Yo, I'm Kakarot Kent. I saw you on TV. Nice to meet ya. You're... you're him. You're alive? You're alive? <laughs> yep. I only got back a while ago, and then I sensed an awesome power coming from the moon. That must have been you, huh? I never thought I'd meet another Super Saiyan. I don't want to be rude, but you look pretty tuckered out. Mind if I take over from here? Uh... Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, right. After everything, this kid just gave me up stronger than I've ever been. You just deserve. You can't just take other people's power and expect to be good with it. As you are right now, you're stronger than me, but you're not a match for me. Parasite charged forward, the massive flailing of flesh crashing against Kakarot's staff, which responded by changing its width expanding into a massive pillar. Your staff is dispersing the force of his blow across the surface of the moon. <laughs> Thanks. Some doctor gave it to me when I was your age. Don't get to use it much anymore, but it does a good job keeping guys like this away. Parasite's mass, however, began to seep over the Ryujigu bank, gifted to Kakarot by Dr. Fate. The martial artist simply smirked as he planted his feet firmly and gripped the base of his staff, which shrank on one end to fit snugly in his hands, while keeping the other end extended. Kakarot then lifted the staff far above his head, 
the moon's lower gravity helping to transfer the momentum to parasites, launching the monster airborne. The martial artist then began to run with the staff, dragging Parasite along like a kite. Try and use your own power next time, okay? Then we can fight for real! See ya! After reaching a good distance from the moon base, Kakarot stopped suddenly before planting the staff in the lunar surface as he began to spin it round and round before Parasite finally came flying off and went hurtling into orbit around the moon. That was incredible! You made that look so easy! Without any unneeded power! He just didn't know how to use his own strength, otherwise I'd have been in big trouble! A horrifying ape-like roar echoed across the area, making Superboy think Parasite might have returned, only for Kakarot to realize it was his stomach crumbling. <laughs> Sorry, he just mentioned dessert and I realized I'm really hungry! <laughs> well come on in Kakarot, I'll have the kitchen get something ready while I work up what to do about Parasite. Though. Looks like you put him into a pretty decent orbit, so I'll have plenty of time. Be right there! Hey, you look pretty drained! Here, take some of my key. Food will help too! Food always helps! Kakarot put a hand on Superboy's shoulder and funneled something back into the boy. Superboy wasn't sure how to describe it. This power... It's like Father's replenishment tank, but... It's so much more... Pure. Uh, it's just key. You know, key! Leo guided them into the subterranean levels of the Lunar Lab, making sure to recover and heal the injured creations Parasite had fought. Superboy was amazed by the massive size of the facility. Kakarot kept looking around for the kitchen. Luckily, he wasn't disappointed when they were led into the massive mess hall. Portals brought in food shipments from Earth, while gigantic plants grew unhampered by normal gravity. Kakarot's mouth watered as he could barely contain himself before being given a nod of approval by Leo to go crazy and eat to his heart's content. Superboy joined in, but much more politely, and made sure to use the eating utensils present. I've known you for years, Leo, but I had no idea you were such a good cook! I thought coming to visit would be all boring science stuff! I pride myself on having very cool science stuff. Oh yeah? Like what? Leo Quintum began to give the Saiyans a tour of his lunar lab, but in the middle of trying to answer Superboy's many inquiries about the nature and function of the equipment, Kakarot fell behind as they rounded the corner where the teleporters were kept. When one of them activated, and Wonder Woman stepped out of the booth. Hola, I have come to assist in your hour of need, Dr. Quintum. Ah, in all the excitement, I neglected to turn off the distress beacon. Oh, so you were able to defeat the intruders on your own, Superboy. I must say that's very impressive. I'm glad we can meet under such happy circumstances. Uh, I didn't do it alone. Oh, did Dr. Quintum assist? Yo, Diana! How you doing? The Amazon's jaw dropped as she saw her teammates. Her friend, she was so sure died fighting, was now standing right in front of her. In a flurry of emotion, Diana ran across the room and lifted Kakarot up in a massive hug. By the gods! How? How are you here? We were sure you died fighting Rogozar! Nope. How did you survive? Well, first I did this. In a shocking burst of power, Kakarot transformed into his Super Saiyan state, the golden aura blinding the surrounding onlookers. Then he blew up the planet, but it was okay because I teleported away. I landed on my friend Mogo. We trained together till I left to War World, where I got hurt by this plant, but then I went all over the galaxy helping people. It was super fun! I traveled through time, I met a girl, me, battled a lot of strong guys, and there was even this one shark. But then I got caught up with Kyle on his planet. He helped me figure the teleporting thing out. When I got home, Sheaves and me did a lot of training. She made this new outfit for me, and then I felt this crazy power here on the moon. So I grabbed old Goldie and I did this. A violet crackle of lightning appeared next to Kakarot, 
that tore a rift in space, which the martial artist used to move from one side of the room to the other, almost instantaneously. And popped up to the moon. Pretty handy, huh? I call it Violet Rift. The Amazon, the scientist, and the Saiyan stared blankly at Kakarot's description of the last year of his life. They weren't sure what to make of it, until Leo suggested something. Um, Kakarot, why don't you come with me? You've obviously been through a lot, and I just want to run some tests to make sure everything's still, um, where it should be. Okay, Doc. Oh, that sounds fascinating. Can you do some scans on me too? The two Saiyans underwent a battery of tests. Kakarot was fine with anything that didn't involve a needle, while Superboy kept corrupting the results because he couldn't help himself from moving about and trying to tinker with the machines while inside them. Once the tests were done, however, Dr. Quintum gave them both the relief that they each checked out fine, but that Superboy would need to watch his calorie intake since his Super Saiyan form was consuming energy faster than his body could produce. Leo sent Superboy to go tell Diana the good news and to allow him to explore more of the Lunar Lab unsupervised. Kakarot prepared to follow, but the doctor called him back. Kakarot, I'm not sure how to tell you this. Tell it to me straight. That boy's genetic makeup. It's unmistakable, and given how you interacted with him, it's clear to me you haven't realized. He's your son, Kakarot. I could kind of tell. His key felt like mine. Huh. I guess I'm a dad now? That's really weird, but kind of neat too. That's not all the test showed. Huh? Your heart, a virus, you're dying. I'm so sorry, Kakarot. The virus is feeding and overloading your body's cells that process key. Apoptosis has begun, a cell death. Your own strength is killing you, bursting your heart from within. Generous estimates would give you five years to live if you ceased all physical activity. And with your new power, Super Saiyan. It's speeding up the process exponentially. I swear to you, I will dedicate every breath I take to finding a cure. But I just don't know if I can. You should try to and find some peace and put your affairs in order. Spend as much time with that boy as you can. Kakarot took the somber news with a quiet grace. He was still saddened at the revelation of his impending doom, but you wouldn't know it to look at him. The Saiyan seemed to shrug off the diagnosis, confident in the ability of Dr. Quintum to find a cure for this heart virus. He just got back home after some time, so he wanted to focus on that. So, Kakarot caught back up with Diana and Superboy. Thank Hera for your good health and return, old friend. Let's get back home. I can't wait to inform everyone in the League that you're alright. Uh, yeah, sure. The three stepped into the Lunar Labs teleporter and were transmitted down to Metropolis. Superboy bid them a goodbye and flew off in a separate direction from Kakarot and Diana. The Amazon, however, noticed a unique look on her friend's face. You look troubled. What leaves your spirit in unrest? Huh? Oh, nothing. Just thinking about that kid. How strong do you think he is? From the legends Vegeta's told me, that golden form is quite astounding. But you've accessed it yourself. Shouldn't you know? Huh? Vegeta knows about Super Saiyans? Neat! I'm not sure about the little guy. I was on the farm and I just felt this incredible power from the moon. Couldn't help myself but to check it out. Hold up a sec, I'ma go ask him. In a crackle of violet light, Kakarot disappeared through a portal generated in front of himself. Wonder Woman nearly got whiplash from the shock of her friend vanishing so quickly. 
a similar sensation overcame Superboy as the martial artist emerged from a portal next to him. Hey, just wondering, how strong are you exactly? Uh, um, pardon? Like if you were to go all out, how strong are you? Well, father's calculations estimate that the upper limits of my energy would be capable of eliminating a solar system. But I I'd never do anything like that. Wow, that's pretty strong. Okay, bye. In another flash of violet energy, Kakarot floated backwards through a new portal. This time, appearing behind Wonder Woman, who was still hovering in the air, trying to figure out where the Saiyan had gotten off to. Gah! He said he could wipe out a solar system! That's so cool! Hey Diana, what exactly is a solar system? I understand you've mastered this new Violet Rift power, but could you please let me know when you're going to use it? And a solar system would be a star and any planets that surround it. Oh! Man, if I was that strong back when I was his age, could you imagine where I'd be now? The two warriors continued to coast through the sky, Kakarot zipping ahead of Wonder Woman. That wasn't anything new. He always seemed to be competing when the League flew together. But there was normally an element of joy to it. He simply continued in a straight line, his head turning back in the direction Superboy flew off in at various points. His mind was wandering, preoccupied on something else. Diana could see in how he carried himself. He clearly was going along with her out of a feeling of obligation. She knew the League could wait to see their friend again. He needed something else right now. Kakarot, that boy, he is so young. Would you put my mind at ease and just make sure he makes it home okay? Oh, uh, sure. Bye, Diana. Hola, old friend. Wait, wait, I almost forgot. Have you heard anything about another Saiyan showing up? Really tall? Ultra strong? Another lives? I'm afraid I have not. Should we prepare for an attack? Nah, Broly's really nice. He ain't like the others. Guess he changed his mind about coming here. Ah oh, well, I bet we'll get to fight someday. I know it. Thanks again, Diana. Diana felt relieved as her friend vanished in the burst of Violet. She'd been concerned that his time away may have changed him. But sure enough, Kakarot was still the same friend she cherished. Hopefully, the same would be able to learn more about Luther and the mysterious boy in his employ. Hi again! Woo, you fly pretty fast! Ugh. How do you even keep finding my exact location? Oh, well my Violet Rip lets me go to anything I love. I love fighting tougher opponents, so I guess I can't help myself by focusing on them. I see. That's an interesting limitation. Now, if you excuse me, I really do have to go. Mind if I come with ya? Been a while since I've seen Lex. I hear he's one of those money face guys now. Technically you're not wrong. Okay, follow me. The two leisurely flew over Metropolis. This time, Kakarot seemed to have regained the joy in his flight, circling among clouds and waving to the terrified populace, who looked to see their local hillbilly very much alive. Kakarot would also try to engage in many races with Superboy, but the young hero remained stoic, not paying much attention to Kakarot's antics, aside from a raised eyebrow here or there. So, why are you still a Super Saiyan? I'm not sure what you mean. Well, I don't normally want to stay in it all the time. It's pretty taxing on your body. You probably wouldn't have gotten so tired back on the moon if you managed your stamina better. Father manages my replenishments. This is the way I was trained. No, please, let's just fly. Lex, huh? I thought he was way smarter than that. Don't insult him! For the last time, move on! Kakarot simply shrugged his shoulders. Eventually, they arrived at the Lex Corp ranch in Metropolis. Superboy walking Kakarot through the sterile and minimalist environment before arriving at a retinal scanner in the back of the lobby, which connected him to a secure line with the acting CEO of the company, Mercy Graves. 
Miss Graves? It's subject GL0115221347. I'm requesting permission to contact President Superman and inform him of the success of my mission. Success? I hardly think Mr. Luthor would call such a disaster success. Regardless, he's currently busy dealing with the fallout from your escapades and doesn't have time for your excuses. But, but... The device ended the call abruptly, leaving the distraught Superboy to stand silently as security arrived to escort him and Kakara out of the lobby. The two Saiyans had flown onto a nearby rooftop in order to get away from any civilians crowning them on the street. The younger of the two was curled up, his head rested against his knees, unsure about what to do, or what he even deserved to do, now that he couldn't get reassurance from his father. They kicked you out of your house? So where are you even gonna sleep? It's fine. This isn't the first time this has happened. I'll just stay on patrol all night again. I remember when I used to go patrol. I was really bad at it, honestly. I would keep getting lost and never find any crime. That's why my friend Lois would always take me to the Daily Planet. They've got all the news there. Oh, I bet Jimmy has a ton of funny stories to tell me when I was gone. We should go there. Okay. Sure. The hero and the martial artist made their way across town to the Daily Planet. Kakarot's casual method of walking into the building causing quite a shock from across the office. Listen, I don't care how many people saw him, I need proof! Hard news requires photographs, otherwise he may as well be Elvis in the Bahamas. Yo, Chief! Olsen, get your camera. Lois Lane and Jenny Olsen were not able to believe their eyes at the sight of Kakarot, the pair rushing to hug the Saiyan. Hey, Jimmy! Your hair got really long! It's... It's Jenny now. I'm a girl! Huh? But you have a- Some girls do. Oh. Neat! You're so cool. Meat sacks! My morning list of demands is prepared! <gasps> Agent Orange had been waiting months, certain that his Saiyan would return, but the revelation of seeing him in that moment stunned the poor Lantern into silence, something the rest of the Daily Planet crew found quite refreshing. Almost immediately, the room burst into conversation as Lois diligently took notes on every detail Kakarot rattled off about his time and space. In a burst of inspiration, however, Jenny grabbed Kakarot by the arm and insisted they interview him for the podcast. Laughley's following along, trying to act... Cool. Yo, I'm Kakarot Kent. Um, you gotta talk to the mic, buddy. Who's Mike? <laughs> oh, oh, you're so funny, Kakarot! Thanks! Wow, this is getting off track. Um, hello, dear listeners. This is your mild-mannered photographer, Jenny Olsen, with a new episode of Olsen and Orange. Coming at you now with an exclusive interview with the one and only Kakarot Kent, who's... alive. Somehow. <laughs> yep. Care to explain how? Don't make him repeat himself! It was a traumatic experience! Why not ask him about important things, like this new outfit? It looks so good on you! I love getting to see those Tamarian pythons that got for arms! Oh, thanks! I like you, Larflees. You're nice! Oh, um, I like you too. Neat! Anyway, my girlfriend Shiva gave it to me. Ow. Oh, uh... Oh man, gotta do some damage control. Uh, I got it! Reusing old content. So, little explanation. Before Kakarot went to space and died, but really didn't, I had a topic lined up for him to talk about on here. Back before the Goat Man turned up. Now, Kakarot, I want you to answer this question with your professional opinion. My pro OP what now? Just 
be honest. Oh, okay. Who would win? Green Lantern versus The Flash, but Green Lantern has the Speed Force and The Flash has to use a power ring instead. Oh, so you mean right? So those are their real names? Oh crap! I'll take care of that in post. Good thing we're not streaming since Laura Flea has got us banned off of Twitch. Phew! Super villains could have killed their families if that got out! <laughs> so, well, I don't know much about the Speed Force. It's kind of tricky. But I have used that promotional spectrum energy before. Emotional. Yeah. And it was a lot like my key. I actually think it is the same thing. But then ha- Green Lantern got mad at me. So I think it can basically do anything. But it takes a lot of training. While the Speed Force guys, I ain't really seen them do a push-up or nothing. So I think if they both got to deal with new powers, it's going to be a lot easier for the train person to figure stuff out. Wow. I honestly didn't expect such a reasonable and well-thought-out answer. Dope. But I'd really like to talk about how I fight them. See, I thought about it a lot. And if you just... Maybe don't reveal the hero's weaknesses to... Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> so this Shiva female, where could one find her? And how much resistance should I expect? Oh, she's always traveling around the world, killing people for money and stuff. Did... did she threaten you? Is that why you're with her? Well, sometimes. And she is pretty strong. Good. Then I shall simply kill her and possess her form for my car! Wait, you mean those creatures I fought when I met you were people once? They were. Now they're mine! That's kinda dumb. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, what? I mean, you want the best things, right? If you just trap people under your control, they're just gonna be the same. Forever! Oh, do you think so? Cause I, um, I, I think so too. You know what? From this moment on, no collecting the souls of my victims! Does this mean you'll stop threatening to violently destroy all of us here at the Daily Planet from now on? No promises. It has been three minutes and fifteen seconds since we began recording. Analytical models dictate this is the perfect place for an ad break. What's an ad break? Is that like a snack break? <laughs> Hello, hello, it is I, a geek for fun, your lord and savior, your what if extraordinaire, here once again to interrupt the video you're so previously enjoying. Very sorry about that, but I promise you this one isn't related to my world domination schemes, it's actually important. Well, okay, maybe it's like 5% related to my world domination schemes, but da -da 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 -da. let's just get to the point. Here at Geeks for Fun, your support has made so many things possible. We've been able to expand our production beyond anything I could have conceived. However, we're still not even close to where I would want this channel to be. As just the reality of being a creator on YouTube, especially a smaller creator, being able to earn a living off this channel is basically an impossibility at the moment. But, there are ways we can do to make this possible for this to become a full-time job for me. If you've been paying attention to the thumbnails and the art you've seen in this episode already, I am an artist. I'm still learning, but yeah, I guess that's what you could call me. And I'm open for commissions. So, if you want art of your OC, or really any previously established character, done to the highest quality level on the internet, you can just pop over to my Twitter or my Ko-fi page and we can work out making whatever you want to be drawn a reality. Outside of that, if you don't want to get any fancy pantsy art commissions and you just want to support me and the team a little bit more directly to this channel, then you can go to our Patreon page. It has plenty of different tiers for all different kinds of price ranges with the $10 and above patrons able to get access to Dragon Ball DC episodes and all of our other what-ifs an entire week early. 
with this kind of power. The power of Patreon. <laughs> so yes, if you really want to help me conquer the world and make this channel do better and bigger things, help us out. This has been Geek for Fun, saying thank you. Now enjoy the rest of the episode. So Superboy, what brings you to the planet? I'm currently on patrol. The Daily Planet is a good resource for fast global information. Or so I'm told. By Luther. What does he say about the planet exactly? No, the president hasn't mentioned it. It was Kakarot Kent. I see. Not a mention from Lex? He doesn't tell you about his history. Odd. He tells me everything. Funny. Then why didn't Daddy tell you about his history with me? I... Th that's... Uh... Don't feel too bad. Daddy hides a lot of things. Like you, for example. Ten years. Keeping a child from the public? Was that difficult to live through? I was well taken care of for those ten years. Don't you mean eleven? Daddy said eleven at the inauguration. So which is it? Uh, you said ten, and I- Right, right. Where did he find your pod, anyway? What was the date? I'm not sure. Uh, I was so young. You mean he didn't celebrate that day as your birthday? I don't have a birthday. I was created over too long a period to narrow it down. Created? Are you just some kind of monster he grew in a lab? Is that what the Super Saiyan is? No! I'm... I'm a hero! The Super Saiyan! It's the same as Kakarot! Hold on, little monster. You and your father can co-opt his image, but you'll never be a hero like Kakarot is. From what I've seen, that isn't saying much. I'm exponentially better suited for the field than he is. And my father, Superman, is the greatest hero of all! His mind can neutralize Kakarot in seconds! What? No way! Superman doesn't stand a chance against Kakarot! I don't know! I did knock him out that one time! Enough! Father is better than all of you! He's better than me! If you think you can handle Father, then you shouldn't have any trouble dealing with me! I want everything you've got! No holding back! Let's go! This sounds exciting! Let's do it! Superboy crashed his fist against Kakarot, who quickly raised his arms at a cross block to defend the blow. But the force still sent him tumbling through an open window and out among the skyline of Metropolis. Superboy followed, leaving flickers of golden fire trailing behind him as the Saiyan continued to throw punches towards Kakarot. The martial artist smiled as he felt the sting of the Super Saiyan's punches through his block smacking him around like a ragdoll. Superboy found an opening in Kakarot's guard, kicking it open with a sudden knee, then launching a devastating right towards Kakarot's cheek. However, the punch had no impact, as the confused Superboy continued to throw punches, only for each of them to feel weightless. Kakarot smiled as he pulled his head back to face the boy. He had been twisting his head at the moment of impact, diffusing any power from the blows as they flowed harmlessly against his cheek. Superboy realized that the gap in experience was serving to neutralize the power disadvantage at close range, so opted to fall back, firing a volley of key blasts as he moved away. The fighter quickly pulled his staff from its sheath and smacked away each blast with incredible accuracy. However, their raw power was more than Kakarot could handle on his base form, and eventually, he was unable to smack away one of the larger blasts, launching his staff into the air and leaving him open from above, which Superboy capitalized on and slammed his knee into the older Saiyan's face. Kakarot plummeted to the ground, but before he could impact, the hero appeared in front of him with lightning speed, throwing a sharp uppercut into Kakarot's gut that propelled him back into the air. The pain surging through the warrior's body was proof that the boy had the goods, and with a smile, Kakarot intercepted Superboy's attempt at a follow-through by erupting into his wrath state. Caught off guard by a form he'd never seen before, Kakarot took the chance to pelt Superboy with a rapid succession of pressure point blows on the boy's arm, leaving the out-of-his-depth hero to desperately try and flail with his now numb arm against the calm Kakarot. He was getting even more frustrated now, and as the boy's frustration grew, so did his speed and power, until a sudden burst in his aura 
allowed Superboy the speed to catch a shocked Kakarot with a devastating kick to the temple, sending him flying into the Daily Planet glow. The Saiyan rubbed his head as Superboy dashed towards him, recklessly throwing wide punches with his good arm that Kakarot slipped and countered with two of his own for each Superboy throw. The amount of exertion and the pinpoint damage being piled on by the martial artist was draining Superboy's engine. Stop dodging! Superboy fired a giant blast in his fury, but Kakarot responded by focusing his energy, creating a portal directly between himself and the blast. Violent Rift! The blast entered the rupture in space-time, and then to Superboy's shock, exited through another, placed behind the hero, crashing against the Saiyan's back and singeing his cape. Kakarot could tell that this fight was done. As impressed as he had been with Superboy's raw power, this had shown that the boy really didn't have any foundation in martial arts, at least of the caliber Kakarot cared about. The temper of the kid also didn't help things. Alright, I've seen enough. Let's stop before this gets out of hand. You did a good job! Father said you were soft. Well, well that's not gonna be enough, because I will never stop fighting! Alright then. You're strong, but you don't know what you're doing. I know how hard it can be to lose a fight, but sometimes you just have to know when you're beat. The Super Saiyan appeared in front of the hero in an instant, and ripped the consciousness from his body with a single blow. The boy began to fall to the earth, but Kakarot caught a small frame in his arms, only now noticing just how frail the boy looked. This fight had been mostly to satiate his own curiosity, but now, he realized it had shown him something a lot more important. This small Saiyan, with the power to destroy solar systems, needed guidance, or he'd just destroy himself. He could tell the Shiva had moved on from his small farm. They'd have to fly. It wouldn't really be comfortable for you if I carried you the whole way there. Huh. Oh, I know! Cloud Somersault! There was a brief period of silence, where Kakarot became slightly worried that in his time away, the other gift of fate had either been hurt, or simply abandoned him for leaving it alone for such a long time. But those worries were misplaced, as the mystical item arrived to his call, as it always would. For there is nothing more certain than knowing there will always be a cloud in the sky when you need it. Kakarot placed the boy on it gently, and flew beside him as the three journeyed to the west. It's okay. He's with someone else. It's no big deal. You've been alone for over three billion years and you're just fine! Still got your looks, your sanity. Not so sure about that one. No one asked you! All right, all right, so angry all the time. No wonder he's not into you. It's no wonder you're all alone. Why are you still in here? Wait, is that still recording? Never mind. You have to help me find my camera. Kakarot and Superboy just started fighting outside the building. It's nothing but. Someone else with Kakarot. Again! Everyone else! Always telling me what I can't have! Well, that's enough! I've tried adjusting to your Earth rules, and it's got to be nothing but sadness! Sadness is not rare or valuable! Damn it! Whoa, hey, bro, if you feel that way, we can talk about it. I didn't mean to upset you. I'm here for you. It is very unusual for me to feel this way! I keep my soul emotion in check, and this... This is quite frightening to me. Don't worry. Forget the fight. Let's just talk here, okay? No craziness. Oh, that's a giant orange snack. That's Ophidian, the entity of Avarice. Yes. For thousands of years, I lay dormant, 
But now I have finally been set free, and you, Laughly, shall never possess me again. I cast you out to the unknown realms of the multiverse. Oh, not again. Are you just some kind of monster he grew in a lab? Superboy's aura flared out and flipped the small card table in the Kent Farm living room. His burst of key would have sent other furniture in the room soaring as well, but Kakarot Kent didn't have that much furniture. At the sound of the boys waking, Kakarot came rushing into the living room and placed a large plate of bacon down in front of the boy. Here you go. Food always helps after a fight. Notice you're still transformed. Even when you were sleeping. You can't turn it off, can you? Superboy looked down in shame. His anger passed now. He hated that it was so hard for him. That he had any trouble being the way his father wanted him to be. The strongest, most brutal warrior ever. But the fight with Kakarot in Metropolis had shown him that his father's ideas of power were flawed. Yes, but I'm... I'm not supposed to need to. Father's calculations say I can maintain it without end. Kakarot looked at the boy with concern. He wanted to help, but wasn't sure how he could. The martial artist opened his mouth to speak, but a sudden rumble reverberated throughout the small house. It was as if an earthquake was hitting Kansas. The rumbling was accompanied by a massive shadow which loomed over the house and extended further and further out into the field. The two ran outside to see what was happening, only to be greeted by the sight of a mighty white tree with blue leaves growing in the backyard. What's happening? No way! Did this happen everywhere I planted them? Yes. From galaxies away, the living planet spoke to its pupil. The seeds Kakarot had taken from Mogo were planted across the universe, the last one buried in the dirt of his farm earlier that morning. And now on Earth existed an alien tree with a direct connection to the sentient world. This was perfect. It was as if Kakarot had made a wish and the universe had granted it for him. Mogo could help Superboy learn to control his power like it had done for him. Kakarot immediately explained his idea to the two of them, but was disappointed by Mogo's response. I will not train the boy. Oh, of course. With the distance between the center of your consciousness and here, you must not be able to communicate quickly enough to establish a consistent repertoire. Indeed, my ability to commune with you would be inadequate. What is your name? I'm Superboy. No, silly, your real name. Uh, it's G O zero one 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 five two two one three four seven seven. That's kind of a lot. Did you maybe have like a nickname or something? Well, you have to promise not to tell anyone. I wouldn't want him to get in trouble. Sure thing! Who are you talking about? There was a robot in the facility where I spent most of my time. Father had built him one night in a board attempt to see if AI could function with a personality unrelated to their work. So he'd make puns. Father didn't like them, but I always found them charming. Well. My subject number happens to share the same number as the serial number. For rice. So the robot thought it would be funny to call me... Gohan. It's, uh... Japanese for rice. Hence the joke. That suits you way more! I had trouble finding my name for a while, too. Nice to meet you, Gohan. Agree. Gohan of Earth. I know of only one individual who could possibly help train you to cope with the power you wield. A great master of martial arts. Awesome, Mo! Who is he so we can meet him? His name is Kakarot Kent. Only you can trade Gohan. That's my girl. You'll be the ultimate warrior. 
No. Don't run from me, Cassandra! Who? A symbol. One I built to defeat death. Can I help? You deserve that costume, Cassandra. You're back, girl. Thank you. They've made you soft. You'll never find yourself in the bat's shadow. I don't kill. Is that really your path? Or his? Someday, you might have been a real challenge. If you'd stop holding back. I'm leaving with the League. Nothing will stop me bringing them back. Gotham is in your hands now. I believe in you. Protect the symbol. Till the return. Cass, I'm so sorry, but... Bruce... He's gone. No! Cassandra Kane jolted out of her sleep. She'd been reliving this nightmare for months. Bruce Wayne was dead. She protected Gotham now. Barbara Gordon, the Batgal before her, wheeled around the cave, heading towards the monitor wall. Barbara had been the one who took Cass under her wing, giving the girl an insight into a world she had never had a chance to experience before. Love. If Bruce had begun to heal the hole left by her father, Barbara had fully become a mother to Cassandra, in absence of her biological one. But even this bond couldn't seem to bridge the wall between them. Cass, for all her strength, for all her reading of people, could never say what she felt. She lacked the tools, and it was slowly tearing her apart. But there was no time for talking now. There was always the mission. Alarms were ringing. They'd been the sound that woke Cassandra up. Before Oracle could even begin to process what the alert was related to, the shadow shaped like a girl was suited up and strapping into her Batmobile. As Cassandra whipped what was more like a jet engine on wheels than a car around the streets of Gotham, she activated the sensory array inside the vehicle. And right on schedule, Oracle's voice came over the transmitter. Ugh, looks like a false alarm. Well, this is an important lesson in not running off before talking to me. Sorry. Is what I would like to say. LOL, JK, it's another psycho. It looks like our threat is at the Pucket Dam off of Scott Street. One of Dick's S's is trying to rip it open. Could mean massive flooding all over Midtown if she succeeds. With Batman gone, you're the only one who can stop Orca. I'm mapping your usual shortcuts now. Cassandra smiled and floored the accelerator, launching the lump of steel and oil at full blast off a construction site, gaining the air she needed for the car to land on a nearby building. She then activated the car's grapnel hook and attached it to one of the closest skyscrapers, and drove off the edge, swinging the Batmobile like a pendulum, and removing the tether at the apex of its swing. Boosters. With an excessive amount of fuel burned in one gigantic blast, the Batmobile was hurtled at speeds that would cause even race car drivers to pass out. Its momentum carrying it across the side of the Cobblepot shipping building smashing a couple of windows before dropping onto a highway, the stabilizers taking a massive hit from the impact. But they could take it. The Batmobile purred for Cass. She just needed to coax it. It spun as it landed, but rather than bothering to get it under control, Cassandra ejected from the car, causing the automatic emergency brake to kick in. As the car screeched to a halt, it nearly tipped over, but its weight was countered as Batgirl landed on the roof. Hate to imagine with all that dirt at the tires. We have a plan, you know. Car faster. You do keep setting new records. Just try not to break this one, and focus on breaking the giant killer whale woman. Orca was lumbering around the site impatiently. She wasn't used to plans of this intricate nature, but... She was good at keeping the mooks in line. As they finished, 
laying down the last of the explosives. The whale woman again tossed the damn guard up into the air, catching him by the shirt with her teeth, giggling at the grown man's childish screams, not realizing as slowly but surely, members of her gang were disappearing into the shadows. Their screams ended by nerve blows before they could begin, leaving the horrified criminals breathless, as they were unable to even hear their own voices, non-lethal of course, and practically painless, but without a doubt, terrifying. Orca eventually looked up from her entertainment torturing the guard, and found that now, she was alone. The tank of a female got up, and marched into the darkness, preparing to demolish anyone who was stupid enough to pick a fight with her. Don't worry whoever's out there, I'm not gonna kill you, I just want to play with you. Cassandra prepared to leap out from the darkness, and take out the oaf, who was leaving herself open in at least seven different ways. But just as she began to make her first steps, a golden light appeared in the sky above them, and purged the shadows. Found you! Caught off guard, Cassandra was struck by a backhand from the giant woman, sending her into some nearby pumps, her pride more injured than her body. Orca, now more curious as to who helped her find her foe, looked up into the sky and saw two Saiyans, who hadn't seemed to have noticed what was going on. My scanners reported that this area possesses the most chatter among known felons. If Batman really is alive, as Jenny said, it's safe to assume he'll be showing up here. You're helping me out a bunch, Gohan. Great job! Now, I can't sense his key, not one bit. Which is weird, but he did always say he was learning how to hide from me. He's gotta be crazy strong now! Thanks to Superboy's involuntary Super Saiyan glow, Kakarot was assured that even if he couldn't sense Batman, he might still be able to see him. He cartoonishly searched the area for a moment, before seeing a familiar cape, symbol, and pointy ears rise to their full height. Batman? Bad girl. Kakarot felt his heart sink a little as the realization dawned on him that this person didn't look like Bruce at all. Well, he was never any good at telling the difference between people, but now he did notice something familiar about this new acquaintance. Gohan, in the meantime, had identified Orca, a known criminal, and decided to assist in his usual fashion. He took a breath, a little bit insecure after his last scolding by Alex, but decided to launch into a pose, ready to announce himself to the foe. Not so fast! No, she's mine. Gohan was stunned silent, as the extremely intimidating costume and sharp tone made the boy take notice. Orca was very confused at all of this, but she did understand the Gotham heroes, and decided to keep her attention on the cloaked figure walking towards her. That's a metahuman by all accounts. A street level hero will be outmatched. We should assist. Oh, nah. If she doesn't want help, we gotta stay out of it. It's her fight. But Mr. Kakarot, greater numbers are the obvious choice here. Just watch. This one, she's got something special. I can tell. Cassandra raised her open palm in front of her chest, and centered her body. No more places to hide! Now you gotta fight me in the open, pipsqueak! Walker blinked, and the shadow vanished. Before the whale woman could open her eyes, Walker fell to the ground with a foot, as Cass shook her fist a little. Such thick skin, wasn't the nicest thing to hear. But, no matter how tough the outside is, you can't beef up your liver. Kakarot's eyes lit up in excitement. He'd only ever seen one person move like that, and he didn't think it was possible for someone else in the entire world to match it. Maybe even surpass it. 
he ran up to Batgirl and with a childish glee, congratulated her on her finishing move. Whoa! That was awesome! You did such a perfect shift of weight! And your arm? There wasn't any unneeded movement in your shoulder! Was it like this? No, no, something like this. It... like this. Cassandra demonstrated the blow, and then Kakarot followed suit, with Cassandra then correcting his form manually. Gohan was dumbfounded, as the two seemed to have completely gotten distracted from the task at hand. Cassandra was a little apprehensive of the stranger. She knew of Kakarot, and Wonder Woman had informed the cave of his return, but she had never met him in person. But most of all, she had never met someone who could recognise and emulate her moves so easily. Not even Bruce. It was a new feeling. Excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt, but Mr. Kakarot? You're looking for Batman, remember? Oh crap, yeah! <laughs> Sorry, I got a little off track. Batman? Didn't you hear? Batman's dead. And now so are you! To everyone's shock, Orko was still conscious. Despite being unable to rise from the floor, she still activated the switch she'd been keeping in her hand. That was primed to blow up the dam. The three heroes were unable to react in time and prepared for the worst, as Orca gave a guttural laugh of victory. However, the dam remained fine. Seconds continued to pass, and the explosives weren't going off. Orca pressed the switch down repeatedly, to no avail. You're wrong, Batman, Batman and Robin, Robin will, will never, never die. die. From the dark sky above, out of their flying Batmobile, the dynamic duo landed among the gathered heroes on the pocket dam. Batman and Robin had managed to jam the signal from Orca's remote trigger, making the bombs planted around the dam no more dangerous than simple hunks of metal. In a quick burst of speed, brought on by frustration, Cassandra pummeled Orca with a series of blows to ensure she was out cold this time. Kakarot was now too preoccupied to admire the surgical precision of Batgirl's blows. The rumours he'd heard from Jenny were true. Batman conquered death. Somehow, some way, his best friend had found out how to cheat the Reaper. The martial artist knew his friend hated it, but he couldn't help himself. He reached out and lifted Batman up in a bear hug. Bruce! You're alive! Afraid not, champ. As quickly as it came, the Euphoria left the Saiyan. He gently put Batman down, as Dick Grayson removed the cowl, the same bright eyes of hope he was used to seeing, now tinged with a deeper sadness. Kakarot understood what Dick wearing that cowl meant. He understood it in a way very few in the world truly could. You wear it well, showstopper. Thanks, buddy. Means a lot coming from you. The touching moment between the heroes was abruptly ended, as the bombs planted all over the dam had their indicator lights change from red to green. A snarky voice rang out over Superboy's wrist communicator. A voice belonging to Edward Nigma, The Riddler. As predicted, the blubber brain failed. But now that I've got your attention, it's time for a riddle. Oh no. <laughs> huh? A riddle? That's right. Solve this brain teaser quick, or Gotham will be Venice 2.0. Without me and within me is death assured, but within you I am life most pure. I hate these. Oracle, you got anything for me? Uh-uh-uh. No cheating, Dark Knight. Water. Humans are 60% water, but they can still drown in it. And if they don't consume any, they'll dehydrate. The bombs scattered around the dam shut down permanently this time, as the group breathed a sigh of relief. Kakarot slapped Gohan on the back proudly, remarking on how clever he was for piecing it together. But the celebration was premature, 
as Riddler's voice came back online. Well, of course you got that one. I practically gave you intellectual children floaties. That riddle was simply a prologue anyway. For tonight, I've cooked up something oh so special. And even with these surprise allies, the dynamic duo will be no help. Riddle me this, Batman. This titan of industry has a new king. How fast will he rise to the top? With the transmission cut out, the gathered heroes looked at each other, waiting for someone to come up with a plan. I've got it! He'll do it really fast! This imbecile was father's closest friend. Did he pick him up where he found you, Richard? Yeah, buy one, get one. If I could find another one of you, they'll give me a discount. Please, there is only one. Me. Yup, there sure is. What do you make of the riddle then, old chum? <laughs> it's banal. However, your impudence has given my subconscious enough time to sort through the possible solutions. It's obviously hinting at my takeover of Wayne Enterprises, the only noteworthy rise in business in Gotham has seen in decades. As a result, the target is Wayne Tower. As I'm sure you'll keep prattling on the way, it'll give them sufficient time to deduce the remaining details. Let's move, Richard. Great work, kid. Never cease to amaze. All right, we're taking the plan. I'm guessing you two will fly. Cass, want to hop in with? See, look. Just hold on like this, and we're off. Understood. Cassandra held on to Kakara as they flew off into the sky. Superboy decided to glide next to the flying Batmobile, analyzing and admiring its propulsion system as it soared through the air. Damien took note that the boy was foolish enough to put his face directly near the exhaust in order to get a better look, being completely unfazed by its heat. Team Chaz going offline. Riddler's got into my system again. I'm going to try to keep him out of anything too important, but I won't be able to assist any further in the field. By the way, I solved the Titan part. There's a giant gorilla. Did she say gorilla? That's ridiculous. Why would she have said gorilla? Is that Vegeta? Wait, no. Vegeta was bigger. Who's this guy? In a display that was shockingly familiar to those that had seen King Kong, Titano, the Super Ape, roared mightily as he began to climb atop Wayne Tower. Dick Grayson, having been at this officially longer than anyone, even Kakarot, wasn't phased by the sight. He'd seen a lot weirder, and was instead focused on why the Riddler would use such a seemingly random ally. It had to be a distraction, but one deadly enough that they couldn't ignore entirely. Had this just been the Bat Family, their options would have been a lot more limited. But with the extra muscle of two Saiyans, Dick felt confident in this team as his safety net. Now, he just had to work out where Riddler was in all of this, which was easy. Edward was always about his ego. Titano wasn't climbing to the very top. He was now just holding onto the upper levels of the building. So that meant his boss couldn't resist being above them all, probably after any files in Bruce Wayne's old office. The caped crusader smiled and opened up the roof of their car. Robin, you do what you do best, and I'll do what I do best. Deal? Same as always, then. Can't you ever make a plan first? Nah, there is a plan. Hit him really hard. I like this plan! Thanks, champ. Batgirl, Kakarot, that window. Batman laughed with a gleeful joy as he glided through the night, Cass and Kakarot following suit, not sure on the intended goal, but having total faith in Dick's leadership. There was an aura around him, a confidence that made you have more faith in yourself by proxy. Titano swung his giant fist towards the free, but before it could land, Superboy, suppressing fire. Damien threw explosive batarangs at the humongous hand. Superboy followed suit and managed to get Titano to focus on the two Super Sons by unleashing his own volley of key blasts. 
That was so fast! How did you know Batman needed you to do that? Amateur. We did what we do best. He jumps. I catch him. Grayson, Kent, and Kane dashed through the building on their way to the top. Kakarot sending a blast all the way from their floor to the roof, and Batman and Batgirl prepared to grapple through this new shortcut. Before they could, Riddler came on through the intercom, causing the group to stay alert, as the mastermind could have booby-trapped the area. Bravo, bravo. Leave it to the world's greatest detective's most cunning mind to think of getting into the building by breaking a window. I'm truly foiled now. Clearly, I could never have conceived of how to stop you from brute forcing your way straight to me. Ha! <laughs> right. To get me in time, you'll need more than quick feet. Riddle me this, Batman. Prayer and fast living can't guarantee a good life, but friends can wish you the best of both. Do you think that one was for us? You know, I think I remember why all of Bruce's villains hated us. This one doesn't seem as specific, but it'll probably... In a torrent of white lightning, Batman was thrown through the hole Kakarot had made, sending him hurtling through the upper levels at blistering velocity. God, speed. The colorless speed still went for another attack, but this time, Kakarot blocked the punch. The resulting shockwave smashing what windows remained undamaged in the room. Guys like you always give me trouble, but I'm kinda excited! Not bad. You're pretty fast, but I'm faster. Kakarot's eyes widened as the image of Godspeed suddenly multiplied into hundreds of afterimages that proceeded to throw out thousands of needle-like punches from every direction. Outpacing Kakarot's attempt to block, and blitzing the overwhelmed Saiyan. Outside, Superboy and Robin weren't faring much better, as Titano was able to deal with Superboy's attempts to attack. The young Saiyan's reluctance to use his full power while knowing civilians were in the building, giving the creature the chance to overpower the boy's own defenses with immense blows. Damien's constant nagging from the Batmobile was no help either. When Titano used his eye beams to try and blast Gohan away, the hero quickly cupped his hands together and caught the lasers with a blast of his own. However, the giant ape kept pouring on more power, Gohan carefully trying to match it. Don't get distracted by those lasers. Pay attention to his true target. His hands are still free. He's trying to draw you in so he can smack you out of the air. Don't tell me how to fight! Stop failing. Robin's assessment of the ape's movements were correct, but he'd mistaken the projected target, as a massive hand not only smacked the Batmobile out of the air, but grasped the young boy in a vice-like grip. Gohan couldn't help but feel a bit vindicated as he casually chit-chatted with Davian while dodging the ape's wild swings. You were saying to pay attention to the true target, yeah? Hold on! Do you mind if I take notes? I want to absorb your strategic mind in action! Not another word. You know, I thought I would have been the one to get grabbed, what with the blonde hair and all. Back inside the tower, Kakarot struggled to try and stand, as Godspeed continued to pummel him to the ground. Oracle was able to re-establish contact with the team, informing Cassandra more on the road they faced and helping to form a strategy. Batgirl attempted to assist by booby-trapping the floor, but the speedster simply phased through them. Something about his appearance wasn't adding up though. She'd studied Bruce's files on the various rogues of the world. This Godspeed was not the typical mad criminal. He was a former detective, one who had gone too far and put his own morals above those he was meant to protect. Why help Riddler? Breaks M.O. Not bad, Kate. You've got heart. But just like the rest of this town, no guts. I'm putting up with the scum that gets a bigger fish. The ones not wearing costumes. Wayne Enterprises is going to start falling apart. They put a damn kid in charge. 
That kind of tech with the worst of Gotham's elite isn't happening on my watch. But I also got a little bonus. I get to take out one of the bastards responsible for destroying Bloodhaven. But... but the Justice League brought everyone back! And you think that's enough? That it makes it all better? People got their lives but lost everything that made those worth living! Their homes, their jobs, and those monkey bastards came because of you! You expect me to let you live with nukes for fists? Godspeed charged up a massive bolt of speed force energy between his hands and brought it down around Kakarot's head. The Saiyan screamed in pain. At first, his scream grew deeper as he focused his energy and transformed into a Super Saiyan before the speedster's eyes. The massive aura blowing the Avatar of Velocity back against the wall. Kakarot smirked as he finally stood back up. I ain't never been quick enough to keep up with you speedy guys before. But now, let's see if I finally broke through that ceiling. Titano had finally been removed from Wayne Tower. But, not out of the Super Sun's efforts. The monster had instead took to the roof of another building in order to use his free hand to restrain the tiring Superboy. Now, both the children were in the ape's grasp. Much to Damien's amusement. Slappy. Caught off guard with your speed? I'm amazed they let you out into the field. You're in his hand right now! I have him exactly where I want him. You're the most annoying person in the whole world! Ever! Listen to me. I've taken your skill set into consideration. My genius has allowed me to create the perfect win condition. Now, Transform into your great ape state. You'll never see it coming. We're gonna die. Are you a fool? Transform at once. Say it. Go! I don't have a tail. I can't transform. This complicates things immensely. It's fine. I can use up the energy I have left in one more giant blast. That should give you the time to get away and inform the others. Tch. That's a ridiculous plan, but respectable. Not to worry. It won't be necessary. It's time for my fifth contingency plan. Alfred, activate protocol. Juliet. Master Damien? Are you sure? Very well. I do hope you're right about this. From the Batcave, at lightning speed, came a familiar face. Damien had spent weeks touching it up and perfecting the intricate details. But the part he spent the most time on was the... <laughs> Tyrannosaurus Rex. Her name is Juliet. She's a B-Rex. In a shocking display of mobility, the robotic dinosaur jump-kicked its way to the roof and clamped its massive jaws on Titano's arm. The ape screamed in pain and reflexively unleashed Gohan, who quickly flew over and rescued Damien from the grip of the monster. The Super Sons then flew over and landed on Juliet's back. Unfortunately, Titano managed to hit the dinosaur with a hard right and damage some circuitry. The power cells are out of alignment now. She won't be able to fire. Unless... Robin shot Superboy a look, one that only young boys with unrivaled imagination could give. Gohan returned in turn, a goofy smile forming on his face. You're serious? I'm always serious. Fire on my mark. Titano charged towards the B-Rex, now in a savage fury. Teeth flared and energy concentrating in its skull, ready to be unleashed. But the monster stopped in its tracks 
as the robotic dinosaur now began to glow with golden power. Bursts of steam emerging from the sides of its mouth. Titano felt a primal instinct it had believed to have suppressed. Fear. Now, Jurassic Jewel! The beam enveloped Titano and sent him hurtling into the sky, before violently crashing back down in the Gotham Bay. Superboy used the last of his speed to keep the impact from causing any waves. The young Saiyan began to lose altitude, but Damien caught him with his grapple and placed him back on top of his trusty steed. The name was unnecessary. Yeah, I, I know, I just get caught up in the moment. I should probably stop. Unnecessary. But cool. Good work, Superboy. Thanks, you too, but, well, I've started going by Gohan, if you want. Very well, Gohan. My name is Damian Wayne. You may be of use to me in future battles. Kakarot was starting to feel his own energy wane. He was stronger than Godspeed now, and was able to land a couple of shots on him after he became a Super Saiyan causing the speedster to take on some pretty heavy damage. But that had only made him more careful, making sure to stay out of range of Kakarot's attacks, then batter him with his own. Hit and run. The Super Saiyan knew them well. They were normally a good sign of a skilled fighter. Hit without getting hit. But Godspeed didn't so much as possess skill, but an overwhelming speed advantage even against the Super Saiyan. Feeling teleportation was his only option remaining, Kakarot sent out his Violet Rift, this time in multiple directions. Purple portals appeared around the hallway they were fighting in, and Kakarot moved between them at random, firing a rapid Chaos Cannon that ping-ponged between the different portals, zigzagging across the room and slamming against Godspeed. Or so it would have, but Godspeed could use the Speed Force, and a Saiyan trick wasn't going to bridge that gap. The Demon of Acceleration felt that time around him had stopped, his perception moving so fast he could simply pick Kakarot up and place him in front of his own attack. As the martial artist tried to push his speed, he felt a sharp pain in his chest, doubling him over and leaving him panting on the ground no longer a Super Saiyan. The martial artist yelled in pain as his own attack slammed him in the back. That hurts, but I'll remember you by that. Almost brave how long you kept fighting. Almost. But you ain't a man. Never were. Never will be. Only men are brave. Now, I'm gonna need a running start to kill you, tough guy. Godspeed got into a sprinter's position, the speed force rippling across his muscles as he braced himself to unleash his strongest punch, one straight line from him to Kakarot's neck. He smiled beneath his mask and ran straight into Cassandra Kane's vest, knocking him out instantly with the momentum of his own power. Pow. Even the most skilled fighters in the world would have risked tearing their own arm trying a tactic like that. But Cassandra was beyond even them. She could read a person's moves, and if she knew the speedster was going in one direction, all she had to do was stay hidden and put her fist out at the perfect moment. Nice save! He almost had me there! Super Saiyan really just doesn't work for people I can't hit! It just tires me out! You had a much better idea. No, you! Big Blast! It was... awesome! Oh, the Chaos Cannon? Like... this? No, no, like this! See? Arms out in front! Boom! <laughs> I can't do it. Sure you can! You're like me, ain't you? Yes, I see now. You have it. It's like you can see a person's moves just by watching them. Your whole body just itching out to fight. I didn't think I'd meet another person who saw the world like me. Me too. Your style. 
Beautiful. Yours is too. Well, it could be a lot better. Your key is all unbalanced. You're probably gonna have bad nightmares if you stay like that. I can help you fix that if you want. Training? Only if you can handle it. Bring it! The two giggled excitedly, throwing out some light sparring moves against each other. Not to fight, but to talk. And the way they both truly could express themselves. Through combat, a language rarer than any other in the universe. As the two martial artists shared in this special moment, they were interrupted by the sound of the Riddler, falling through the hole from earlier and impacting on the ground with a painful thud. Dick Grayson appeared from above and landed beside him, having taken care of the perplexing puzzler in quick fashion. Bruce's villains were never able to properly adapt to Grayson. Riddler's down. Looks like you all acted bravely, and the boys got pretty bold. Not bad for our first team up. We cause the earth to shake. Kingdoms we consume. Strike one down and no difference will it make. All move in time to seal your doom. Riddle me this, Batman. What are we? I'll mail my answer to Arkham when I get the time, okay? Night. Batman used a nerve pinch on the Riddler's neck, knocking him out cold and ready to be rounded up with the rest of his strange new allies. Kakarot and Gohan joined the rest of the Bat family in the cave, resting up after the hard-fought battle. Oh, you're looking seriously drained! Don't worry, I'll bring you back up! Here! Kakarot turned Super Saiyan and gave Gohan enough energy to replenish himself. So my father died to help you unlock a power like this. I hope you were worth it, Kakarot Kent. Damien looked respectfully at the man his father died to save. He bowed in a show of honor. Then he turned to Gohan, and they went to go examine the B-Rex and other Wild Workshop inventions of the Batcave. Some time passed and Kakarot and Cass continued to compare techniques, copy each other's moves, argue about stances, and compare workout routines. She's really getting along with the champ. He's always been great with kids. Head still in the sky, Pixie Butts. She's never talked this much. Not with anyone. This... This is what she needs. I hate to say it, but... Right now... We're not the best place for her. We've all got to spread our wings out of the cave sometime. We're growing up too fast. Now, Superboy, prepare for the awesome might of Bat-Cow. No! Such power! I impossible! Alfred had prepared a dinner worthy of a Bat family and two Saiyans, filling the Great Hall of Wayne Manor with so much food, even Laughleys would have been overwhelmed. The butler thought to himself, as laughter echoed across the room, that this would have made Master Bruce proud. Dick made sure to sit next to Kakarot, and had a brief catch-up with his old idol, before moving on to the matter at hand. Hey, so me and Babs have been thinking. There's something I want to ask you. Would you help train Cass? Take her in at the farm? Huh? Oh yeah! Yeah, sure! I'd love to. I was planning on something like that anyway. But, uh, could you give me a sec? I've got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> oh, no problem. Down the hall, champ. <coughs> Kakaro stared in the mirror of the bathroom before plunging his head down in the sink once again, violently coughing up blood. His hands were shaking. His body felt light, and his chest was on fire. The Super Saiyan was reduced to a shivering, pale mess. 
terrified of what he saw in his own reflection. <laughs> You're not looking so good there. <coughs> Prince Vegeta looked out the window of the Oval Office, watching the sea of reporters and protesters gathered outside. Tensions were high in the room, as President Lufor tried to keep the focus on what brought Wonder Woman and the Prince to the White House. Kandak's leader was threatening to invade Greater Bialya, which Lex had finally gotten to open trade. If it were to fall into the hands of Black Adam, then there's no telling the damage it could do to his political achievement. I must admit I'm surprised you'd call me on to come up with this. Ever since you resigned from the Justice League, you've seemingly done nothing but rally ire against us, present company in particular. You're referring to my critiques, and I assure you they're just that. I respect you in the League, Diana. You know that. But we all need to have people on the outside who can stop us from crossing a line. Batman understood that. May he rest in peace. I will admit to being apprehensive of your choice. I'm more than willing to say when I'm wrong. Vegeta here seems to be putting his best foot forward by all accounts. I'm just glad to have a chance to help demonstrate his newfound growth as a hero to the public. Aren't you kind? Honestly, I'm surprised your guards would let me into your capital. Not much of a palace, if you ask me. Guards? What guards? I retired the Secret Service on day one. What use would I have for guards? I'm Superman. Besides, we all know I have nothing to fear from you, right? You're one of the heroes now. Yes. That's what I am. A hero. Half a world away from this meeting, another was taking place. But not in person. To do so would arouse too much suspicion. So a holographic phone call would have to suffice. The leader of Kandak argued with a shadowy figure. He joined their cabal in order to keep the heroes of the world in check, to protect Kandak. But now that he was being called on to allow these heroes into his own land, his own country, all as a part of some master plan, he was displeased, to say the least. I am not some pawn to be manipulated for your machinations. I demand to know why you request such a thing from me. We simply require data. The boy from Metropolis, the re-emergence of Kakarot Kent, and now the Saiyan Prince. All have reached this new level of Super Saiyan. In order for our plans to move ahead, we must know what we face. And you are our most powerful operative. You can push the Prince to his limits, and then send the Amazon away to lick his wounds. Well... If it is a demonstration you wish, yes, this could be arranged. On Kent Farm, Gohan and Cassandra had expected another day of training, of listening to Kakarot Kent describe how to reach and channel key properly, how to keep it in check so as to not overwhelm, in Gohan's case. The boy was letting too much of it go in mere moments, when a fight became too intense. His energy poured out of him, along with his emotions. Which was almost the exact opposite problem Cassandra faced. She was so controlled, so focused all of this time, that if it continued this way, she may never achieve what she was truly capable of. She needed to learn how to let her spirit flow naturally. But instead of focusing on that, the three were in a barn, looking at a cow. An incredibly fat cow. This particular cow had managed to get itself pregnant, and so the day's training was put on hold to deliver the calf. Wonder Woman and Vegeta had headed to Kandark in Diana's invisible jet, and after some time, the peace talk ceremony went underway. 
Wonder Woman was usually happy to go along with the pageantry of events like this. But this was getting ridiculous. For four hours, the king had taken her and Vegeta around the capital. They'd seen hospitals, schools, government labs, and now they were being walked down the royal palace portrait hall. While this could perhaps be an opportunity for learning some of Kandak's rich history about its leaders, Black Adam had ruled for hundreds of years. All the portraits were nearly identical, and if Wonder Woman was getting exhausted, it was no small surprise that Vegeta had grown outright enraged. The prince had initially been intrigued to see how Earth rulers ran matters of state. Even the reputation of this Black Adam as the homicidal king garnered his attention. But it was clear that nothing was being done, and that was not something the prince could stand for. Is this some kind of ridiculous earthling technique? Boring us to death with pitiful distractions? Do you Amazons always allow your slaves to speak? Vegeta is not a slave! You see my confusion, yes? A defeated enemy redressed in your colors, attending your side? I meant no offense. Your mercy is unsuited to it. Had the three monkeys attempted their invasion on my soil, I would have split them down the middle. We wouldn't have been fool enough to destroy a kingdom of disease and sand. Not very grand to demolish a palace that's already in tatters. I will not fail like you did, lording over bones and space ash. Better to have died in strength than to squirm on in this squalor. On that note, surely you understand why any kind of war would only serve to put further strain on your people. President Luthor has drawn his line in the sand. We're here to help make sure that there's no need to get near it. President Luthor, Princess of the Amazons, leader of the Justice League, American lapdog. Oddly enough, it was this that seemed to get the biggest rise out of Vegeta, to do what he knew Luthor had really sent them to do, put this warrior king in his place. Vegeta was all too familiar to a hidden motive. For both Darkseid and this Lex Luthor used similar language when launching missions of war. Vegeta who had been leaning against the wall near one of the many portraits, brushed it with his shoulder. The ancient painting fell to the ground and crumbled to dust. Oops. Just as he moved, the charade of peace was over. Faster than lightning, Black Adam had maneuvered around Wonder Woman and knocked Vegeta through the wall with a massive double hammer punch. Sliding through the sands outside the palace, the prince smirked the action he'd been waiting for. A simple mission. Defeat the homicidal king, end the brewing war, and let the bald man take the credit. He'd have turned it down any other day, but he'd yet to have the opportunity to assess the limits of the Super Saiyan form. And this king of sand seemed like the perfect test on it. I've been told you draw your powers from so-called God. Then allow me to show you the legend of my people. <laughs> the Super Saiyan smiled as he witnessed Black Adam recover in midair. Bruised, but clearly not entirely outmatched. Good. Maybe he could stretch his legs at last. A bolt of lightning was hurtled at Vegeta, but the prince cloaked his own hand in his aura and caught it out of the air, then threw it right back at Adon, who was even more insulted at such an impudent act. It was a tactical showboat, as now Vegeta took the chance to appear behind Black Adam's lowered guard and knee him in the ribs, preparing to fire a blast of his own at the immortal. But Adam was surprisingly quick and grabbed Vegeta's hand, smashing it into the prince's own head, returning the favor from earlier. A quick combination of blows echoed through the sky, 
as they darted across miles and moments, gaining a greater sense of each other's fighting style and how they both planned to overcome it. Wonder Woman, focused on keeping the damage erupting from the two displays of power from hurting any civilians, and saving what architecture she could. Back at Kent Farm, two strangers had landed on a cornfield, frankly amazed at how well kept the land here was, but it didn't distract them from their goal. Kakarot Kent was alive, and they were here to make sure that didn't last long. Alright you two, this will be a good lesson in control. My ma helped me control my strength by looking after the animals. They're quick to let you know if they ain't comfy. But there's no need to worry, I'm gonna watch and make sure you don't do nothing bad. Well that's a mess of relief. I've been very curious about the birthing process, and being able to have a mentor while I learn is a great opportunity, Mr. Kakarot. Sparring? Nah, this is even better for you. Sometimes you can learn to fight without fighting. Okay. Anyway, first things first, and this is really important. You have to- Kakarot! Kent! Ah, oh, nuts. I'll be back in a sec. Good luck! Wait, what? Kakarot used his violet rift to teleport out of the barn and appear next to two old foes on his doorstep, Atomic Skull and Metallo. He had faced them both countless times over his career, but he'd never seen them team up. They'd be nothing to him as he was now, even with his current circumstances. But the fact that they seemed confident had him excited. Yo guys, been a while, huh? You still up to evil and stuff? We're here to kill you. That's all this is. We thought we'd never get the chance, but thanks for surviving so long to let us get the honor. No problem. You're still as dense as ever, but we've changed. We've made up for our weaknesses. Oh, really? You guys been listening to my suggestions on how to get stronger? Yeah, you know, you made some pretty solid points. Don't you think him? R right forget this talk. We're here to kill. Let's do this! Bring it on! Commence! Fusion! Metallo's body opened up in a bizarre display of metal. The full skull stepped into his now open form, Metallo closing around his ally, forming a suit of armor around his figure. How do you like this? Neat! You guys are super strong now! Thank you. We've really been impressed by the results. Don't you thank him? You guys are like a married couple. <laughs> we are married. Kakarot was happy to hear his two foes could find love, but way more interested in their new combined strength. The outer shell of Metallo prevented Kakarot from dousing the Tommy School's flame. And now, Metallo finally had a suitable power source. The pair charged at Kakarot, who readied up with his Ryujingu Bank, eager to battle. In the barn, however, the once eager Gohan was now panicking at the thought of having to deliver a baby without supervision, listing off all the different ways the procedure could go wrong, unable to stop his hands from shaking, as the thought of failing an innocent life by his lack of knowledge began to overwhelm him. Hello? W what? Uh, sorry, I. I don't know where to start. Well, I do, but it could go wrong. Useless. I'll handle. Cassandra was in mission mode, watching the cow's movements and analyzing what was happening to its body. But as she approached the cow, the beast grew distressed and tried to kick her away, as if it could sense the danger of Cassandra. Batgirl couldn't help but notice how easy death could reach the animal, it was how she viewed the world, and the cow was terrified of her as a result. It's scared of you! If it stays dressed like this, we could lose the baby! Sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Back in Kondark, Vegeta and Black Adam's war continued to ravage the land. Key blast volleys and lightning surges rippled in every direction. Their immense speed, leaving no area untouched, had Wonder Woman not been able to keep up and protect what she could. Black Adam could see that Vegeta looked to be tiring. This new state was obviously draining on the fighter. 
and what had been a sizable gap in their strength, now began to fall in Black Adam's favour. He struck Vegeta in the chin with an uppercut, then grabbed his neck in a chokehold, which could have ended the prince's life had Vegeta not reacted with a vicious headbutt against the divine empowered warrior, smashing his spiked hair into the dictator's face. In a moment that surprised both fighters, Wonder Woman jumped in between the two and began to attack the prince, hoping to recapture his attention in the only way that seemed to get through to him. I will not let you jeopardize our charge because of your ego! Jeopardize? I was sent here for this! Your former subordinate clearly wanted this fight! Hell, he brought it on! <laughs> so it has a brain. <laughs> there you have it. Now stay out of my battle! Diana felt sadness well up in her heart. The manipulation was clearly obvious to everyone else. But she had truly believed that this was a mission of peace. Fine, fight like children. This interruption gave Vegeta a reprieve, and let him consider what the battle had taught him. Super Saiyan did not serve for long engagements. Its immense power was not continuous. Should an opponent be strong enough to stay alive in the earlier portions of the fight, the latter half of a battle became much more difficult. If Super Saiyan won't last till the end of a battle, then I just need the power to end battles instantly! The Saiyan cupped his hand together and began to charge his Gallic gut. But instead of firing the beam instantly, he continued to hold in his energy, feeling that he was approaching the answer to his problem. The Super Saiyan might flowed through his veins and enriched his cells, his muscles breaking down and healing rapidly, growing in size as he continued to charge, despite now being in great pain. He was close, he could feel something. The door of Super Saiyan pulled at the hinges, letting the power lock behind it flow through greater than ever. But Black Adam would not allow such a thing, and while the prince was distracted with his new discovery, the tyrannical tyrant used all of his speed to strike the Saiyan directly in the gut of a punch, not allowing Vegeta the time to react, and the energy began to fade from his hands. Your grandiose displays of power leave you ripe for attack. The prince responded with a single punch of his own, a glowing purple fist cracking out on across the temple, and then opened his palm. Firing what remained of the Gallic gun and engulfing the king in the attack's big bang. Vegeta hadn't lost all of his energy. He had just made his outward aura recede after he got hit. Counting on the fact that Black Adam had no experience with key users and how they could hide their power. A trick he had picked up from Kakarot. As much as that fact annoyed him. You talk too much. Black Adam's body was singed. That attack had been incredible, even compared to the might the Super Saiyan had shown prior. If Vegeta could achieve that level of power at all times, the thought terrified the king, and he decided he would not allow this to come to pass. Vegeta too could tell the battle was coming to a close, and charged back at Adam, his Super Saiyan power shining defiantly. On Kent Farm, Impacts of Kakarot and Metallic Skull fighting shook the bar, and made matters even worse for the two youngsters faced with one of the most stressful situations of their lives. Which was saying a lot. Kakarot, however, was having a blast, but had noticed something that was now giving him the edge. I don't get it! How are you dodging us so easily now? You haven't realized? Or did you not think of the issue here? What is you? Did you mess up, John? Me? It's probably you not having enough power, Martin! Kakarot took the chance to burst from his wrath state into his Super Saiyan form for just an instant, giving him the power and speed to jam the Ryujingu Bang into Metallic Skull's chest and tear the two of them apart in one decisive move, before returning back to his base state. It's your energy! 
Yeah, you've got the right idea, but combining two people's powers ain't as simple as just forcing it together. There's gotta be a balance there. Like two rivers. Your arguing made it more like lightning in a forest. Man, you really know your stuff. You should teach this. Damn, you're right. They said it'd be way easier than this. Huh? Who did? Uh, never mind. You can take us to jail now. Just go on your own. I'm busy. See you guys. Try and find that balance. Kakarot began to return to the farm, leaving its two confused foes to sit with each other for a moment, before deciding to take the chance while that could, and ran back to Metropolis for a drink. Inside the barn, Gohan and Cass had overheard Kakarot's words, and both the students of Ken realized what their issue was. Cass had the focus, Gohan had the mind, but without the other, they were both useless. Gohan, breathe. Uh, what? Like me. Watch. Breathe. Cassandra took deep breaths, and Gohan followed suit, tuning out the world around him and calming himself down. He was still too nervous to try the procedure himself. But he was now relaxed enough to at least suggest another idea. Mr. Kakarot showed me that he... It's a life force. It just doesn't have to destroy. It can heal and calm. If I stay by the cow and soothe it, c could you follow my instructions and deliver the baby? Yes! Perfect. Then... Uh, well, let's get started. Vegeta and Black Adam were locked in a grapple, lightning and aura smashing and crackling against each other. Their strengths were being pushed to the limit, and neither one seemed able to budge. Until Vegeta, slowly but surely, began to gain ground, inch by inch. His muscles were swelling once again. His key was being poured into them, forcing Super Saiyan to act for his will, dragging the energy, kicking and screaming to the surface. The power of myth was his birthright, and it would bow to him. this newfound power, Vegeta began to push Black Adam to the floor, the Immortal's arms now at the breaking point. This, this is the Super Saiyan, you weakling! This is the only myth that matters! No god is greater, do you understand? Black Adam desperately tried to fight, but it was to no avail, as his attention had been caught by something else. Around him, his people screaming and running in terror from the might of this love in the earth. No. From him, too. Wonder Woman was the only thing preventing any casualties, and it reminded the ruler what power he believed in above any god. His people. You are mistaken. Shazam! As the bolt of lightning came down, Vegeta dodged out of the way, 
letting go of his grip. From beneath the smoke, a frail old man emerged where Black Adam had previously stood, leaving the Saiyan Prince to frantically search as to where his foe had escaped. I trust this means this is over? Yes, this has gone far enough. I have my pride, but it is tempered by my duty. I will not damn my country over a grudge match. I can clearly see what such a thing reduces a man to. Thank you for protecting my people, as I knew you would. Shazam! Black Adam flew off, returning to his castle. Diana was unsure if this had made things better or worse, but it definitely wasn't how this was meant to go. Coward! Next time, think twice about challenging the Super Saiyan! We're leaving. Now. Vegeta powered down, taking a heavy breath as he returned to his base form. He ached all over and was exhausted. But that didn't matter. There was a joy filling him now. He had found a new path. Something to focus on and perfect. Then... He truly would be the Super Saiyan. The two royals reboarded the invisible jet and made their exit. While she was disgusted by everything that had just transpired, she wasn't going to simply pout. True strength required confrontation. But this time, she would not let the Saiyan make her lose her temper. A talent he, almost exclusively, Possessed. You disgrace your honor. Excuse me? When this opportunity was presented, I asked you not to squander this legendary power. By engaging in brawls, with no regard for the circumstances, you dishonor your vow. If you were paying attention, you'd notice who attacked first. But did you need to respond? You were right, you were sent to get in a fight. Has the notion crossed your mind that embracing the worst expectations of others is foolish? No, of course it hasn't. You tapped into more power out there. That's all you care about. Yes. Yes, it is. I can sense him, you know. Every day since his return, he's sitting on a mountain of power, and I need to know if I can reach its summit. Why? Tell me why. I am the pinnacle of the Saiyan race, and yet somehow, despite all odds, he achieved the legend. The legendary Super Saiyan was meant to only appear every thousand years, but I've reached it now. How could there be two of us? Three? I need to know which one of us it truly is. Against her better judgement, the princess adjusted the jet's autopilot and turned to look at Vegeta. She couldn't place why, but something about him seemed to always make her throw intuition to the wind. Kakara leaned against the Mogo tree, using his senses to monitor what was happening in the bar. Initially, he'd planned to rush right back in and walk the kids through the rest of the bar, but when he'd gotten close to the bar, he saw that they had things under control, at least for the moment. Now. His two students were too busy to even notice he'd been free of the fight for a good while, so he waited with Moga. After more time passed, Cassandra pulled the car fully from its mother. Her Batgirl costume was ruined. Meanwhile, Gohan was perfectly clean, though he looked worse for wear. The poor boy couldn't help but puke now that the task was done and the adrenaline was wearing off. Cassandra was also now having trouble with holding the calf. They'd done great in the moment, but still needed to work on consistency. Kakarot, proudly sensing everything that was going on. Those students of yours have a... harmonic synergy. Huh? You mean they work well together? Yes. They have the potential to be their other half, and find balance as a pair. I thought so too! 
I'm gonna go celebrate with them. I'm afraid that may need to wait. It appears your other half has arrived. Kakarot sensed it shortly after Mogo did, and instinctively, a bead of sweat fell down his face. He was finally here. The Geo and Wonder Woman had parked the jet just outside the farm in Diana's usual landing spot. The prince spared no moment approaching his fellow Saiyan, locking eyes with him for the first time since their battle. So long ago. Hey Vegeta! Been a long time! I see you're just as impudent as ever, Kakarot. Yeah. Looks like you're different, though. Somehow you're even stronger than before. You have no idea, clown. Vegeta erupted into his Super Saiyan form, the wind blowing Kakarot's hair back as his eyes widened in joy. Superboy had been one thing, but Vegeta was different. This level of power was mind-boggling. Even Diana had never seen Vegeta unleash it to this extent. Kakarot truly did motivate him like nothing else. A Super Saiyan? You know, I knew if I could do it, you could pull it off too. Not bad. Transform. I saw you, the image of you achieving this state. It's burned into my soul. Show me again, and let me purge that indignity. Kakarot took a deep breath. It came much harder to him now, but the power was still his, and he drew it to the surface in an awesome showcase of tranquil fear. This what you wanted to see, Vegeta? You, cloaked in the same mythic robe as I. No, that will not stand. Today, Kakarot, today you meet your doom. They both assumed their battle stances, ready for the first sign to strike. Thank you for your time, Kakarot. We're leaving now. Sorry for any interruption. Diana appeared between the two Saiyans, and Vegeta felt the urge to kill dissipate, replaced by embarrassment and fury at the Amazon, forsaking his destiny once more. But he knew by the look in her eyes that she would try to stop him by force, and any ensuing fight with Kakarot would be tainted. The two Super Saiyans powered down, and Vegeta began to walk away. Fine, I can wait. Prepare yourself, you low-class scum. Your day of reckoning will come by my hand. Right. I'll... see you then. The jet flew off, and Kakarot felt his heart once again. He knew in his current state, he was missing a gigantic amount of his power. And it was getting worse by the day. A fight with Vegeta might have been the best chance he had for one last, true, battle. The royal pair flew in silence for the majority of the way back to Paradise Island. That is, until Diana turned to face Vegeta. Why did you interrupt? You know that if I didn't stop you, you would have tried to commit a genocide. I will not allow that. Vegeta remained silent. Diana raised the lasso, daring Vegeta, that if her statement wasn't true, to hold it and prove he really wasn't planning to damn his race to extinction. I can fly the rest of the way there. Stay out of Saiyan affairs. You do not understand. Vegeta opened up the cockpit and darted out of the plane, flying back to his quarters. Alone. The other Saiyan, standing amidst his farm home, was finally snapped out of his fog by the sound of Gohan Cassandra, running out of the bar. Oh, hey guys! Great job there! Sorry, did the jet make you curious? Jet? Wait, no! Someone was here? Yeah, just Diana and Vegeta. 
Nothing important. The princess? The superhero! I guess you're a big fan. So cool! If you didn't come to see Diana, though, why'd you run out? <gasps> I almost forgot! You need to come quick! Twins! Huh? <laughs> hey, it's me, Kakarot! Man, Lex sure is inviting a lot of people over to his new house. Now Mercy is taking us, too! Well, I guess it'll be a good chance to ask him about Gohan's mom. On your feet, Superboy. We do this together. You don't touch them! You don't touch any of them! Next time on Dragon Ball DC, Olympus has fallen. <laughs>